Hello and welcome. This is Daryl Ehrlich and this is the Billings Gazette Stories of Honor 2019. And today I am lucky to have Bill Bernhardt, uh, who knew my family, goes back to Laurel. And uh, we're going to talk to him about his time in service. Thanks, Bill, for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. So, Thank you. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning. You're from Laurel, correct? Yes. Born and raised? We were, yes. I was born just southeast of Laurel. Okay. Uh, down by the river. Uh, and... Uh, at the time I'm, I got married, my, my father had three boys. Okay. One was a year and a half older than me, and one a year and a half younger than me. I was right in the middle. Okay. And we were all 1A. The draft was going on then. Okay. And what year uh, was that? In 1950. Okay. And uh, we... We were in 1A, and we were just kind of sitting there. We had farm deferments. Okay. My dad was farming, and uh, he, it was that way. Two of us, my older brother and myself, had been to Butte, had physicals. We were all 1A, okay. physically fit, and uh, we, this went on for two, three years. Okay. And uh, we got married. Okay. On August the 4th. All right. And uh, I had you had to go down to the draft board and and uh, let them know about their change in marital status. Okay. And uh, so we went August the 4th and we went a couple of days in honeymoon through the park and we came back about and the 6th I went down to the draft board. And we were still one of my brothers too, and they were both single. Okay. And uh, I went down and reported that I got married, and I got a notice to leave the sixth of September. One month later. How did? Why? Uh, now, were you were farming? Were you farming, or what were you doing? Yeah, we were. I was. So you, I was still home farming with my dad. So you were farming, and you were married, and they called you. That's. There was a reason you? for that. They. Why? Well. Uh, they picked me out of there because I got married, and if your, if your wife was pregnant, you were, excused. You were right. deferred. Right. And they. That wasn't the case, so they took me. And I think they had plans of maybe getting another one of the two in the future if they if this kept up. You didn't, I'm guessing, now maybe I'm wrong, Bill, but I'm guessing you thought that because you were deferred for a farm and you were married that you... I didn't, that didn't enter my mind at all. I had no idea that they'd pick me out of the middle. Right, what and, did you do when you got that? Do you remember getting that notice and what did you remember thinking? It was a shock, absolutely. Yeah. And just got married, had a new wife. Right. And and how old were you at the time? I was just uh, 21. 21. So you think you're thinking I'm going to farm? I'm going to have the rest of well, my life? Well, my dad, we we had, we were had farm deferments, so he got it deferred for three months. Okay. So I, I was hoping maybe it'd get over by then. Right. But, uh, well, we through the harvest season. Right. And uh, after I had, I left 6th of December. Wow. For the Army. And it was short time I was in Korea. Right. I did, I was, uh, well, basic training down in uh, Fort Lewis, no, Camp Roberts, California. Okay. And... Uh, she came down there to visit me at uh, uh, Christmas time, I think, and I came home for a 10 day leave. Okay. We came home together, and uh, at, uh, then I left and I was on the way to Korea right away. Did you at the time, were you aware that Korea was going on? Oh, yeah. On? Oh, yeah. Okay, it, was, so it was the, I w this was the second winter of the Korean War. Okay. I, that was the really, Devastating one, or they just beat the heck out of mostly the Marines. Right. And uh, I, anyway, I got over there in short order. They even flew us over. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, 
uh, what the hell was I going to say? <laughs> so, so they got you over there quickly because most guys went over on ships, but they needed replacements no, after their. I flew over. Yeah, right. And and that was my first airplane ride. <laughs> what was that and like? It was a thirty-six hour flight. Wow. Twelve, three twelve-hour hops. The first twelve hours was to Hawaii, and the second twelve hours was to uh, Wake Island. And during World War II, there was a lot of fighting on Wake Island. Yeah. And there was old rusted out gun implantments all the way across that island. When you come in for a landing, you would see that island from one land to the other. It was just a landing strip and a plane refueling place. Hmm. And uh, so then the third 12 hours was Tokyo. Okay. And... Uh, that's when Would you, have you been out of the states much? Uh, no. No. I was home in Laurel. That was my first airplane ride. And what did you think of your first airplane ride? Oh, I was scared stiff. Yeah. They were not jets. Right. They, they were, were four-engine prop plane, big uh, commercial airline planes. Okay. And there was only probably half a dozen soldiers on there. Hmm. What were you trained to do? What was your training in the uh, army? Or Marie, it, it, no, I was drafted into the army. the army. So, what was your training? Was it uh, infantry? I was in. I was fortunate enough to get in a heavy weapons company. Okay. Which is one step up from the soldier, the foot soldier. Yeah. We had vehicles and machine guns and mortars. Uh huh. And uh, in a way, I. That's the reason I don't have. We didn't have no ear protection or anything. Right. That's the reason I can't hear today. Right. We we had these big 80 millimeter mortars that sat on a platform and like a stovepipe. And you drop a shell into them about like a bowling pin. Big shell. Right. You stand right beside that thing, boom, and away it'd go. So it was loud. Yeah. It was really loud. And we didn't have no ear protection. Did you did you even think about it at the time that you might be losing your hearing? No. No. How long did it? How long were you in basic? Did they rush you through basic? Yes, I, well, three months, I think. That's minimum. Okay. And I think we had a had a little extra on the heavy weapons. Okay. But uh, we it was pretty fast getting me over there. Were the other Were there other guys who were twenty one who were with you who were married? Most of them were younger than me. Okay. Like 19 to 20. Yeah, most of them, I'm guessing, were not married. Yeah. Were you worried about going over to Korea? Absolutely. I had a new wife at home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did, she, did, did, um, uh, did you have any idea how long you'd be over there? Did they tell you how well, long? Well, <coughs> the whole peninsula of Korea it was divided into time, uh, zones mm -hmm. for rotating home. There was a one... One point per month zone, a two point, three point, four point. So the quickest you could get out of there was nine months, 36 okay. points. You needed 36 points to rotate. Okay. And, uh, and you also had to have a replacement before you go home. So they that, not only needed, you needed the points, but you needed a guy coming in for you. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, I, I got, my outfit was the 45th Infantry Division, which was the Oklahoma National Guard. Okay. And the National Guard men got whipped in the first winter from 1950. Mm -hmm. And I was over there in the second winter, which wasn't quite. It was the, the DMCs were more defined at that time. Okay. And uh, it was just back and forth. The Chinese were in there. And uh, so, the, all these stories, I don't know if you read up on that, but the, there was like the punch bowl. Yeah. I saw that. I wasn't involved in it, but it was just a big, like 160 acre field down in a hole. Yeah. Ridges all the way around it. And uh, there was a. Uh, uh, Mountains. It was. We were. I was on the eastern edge, eastern side of Korea, and it's real mountainous. Okay. And uh, there, them mountain peaks were so close together. 
at one time we, they would have you on the front line for a month or so and then pull you back a little to the division rear for a little recuperation and re and reorganizing and uh, then you'd maybe go back in a little bit different area okay and there was always just patrols going out and and the chinese were there and they uh one time i was when we were back I, like i said we were i was in a heavy weapons company we had a motor pool and trucks mm -hmm. i was designated to take a two and a half ton truck up the mountain and get some guys to come down for showers because okay. they were living in a hole in the ground. Yep. It was like rats with the rats. Yeah. And uh, I was up there to get guys, and I'm running down uh, down this trench, and I get, start shooting at me, so I crawled the rest of the way. Wow. And that trench was down the front of that hill, hmm. and it was so close to the enemy's hill that there was we had chicken wire over the trench stop their hand grenades. They could throw hand grenades back and forth. They would roll down the hill and explode down the hill. Hmm. And it was unbelievable. So it was like, the, it was yeah. like a big peak, peak. You could see the, you could throw hand grenades back and forth. Huh. That's how close them peaks were. Wow. And uh, I had, uh, there come a guy and he was filthy. Right. Big time filthy. And he was a kid from Laurel that I knew who he was in school, but he was a little behind me. And uh, he come out of there and he was mentally about half shot then. Right. And he come and hugged me. He recognized me. It was pretty, pretty, you, pretty traumatic. Yeah, I see that. Did you, were you shocked? I mean, not only, I imagine you were shocked by the condition, but you were shocked to see someone else. Well, I, I was too, but not as much as him. Yeah. And. Uh, he was a kid that was uh, rest down in the east end of Laurel, the, what they call railroad town. Yeah. And he was an orphan kid hmm. raised by his grandfather. They, they never had good clothes or anything. Yeah. Poor, poor kid. Yeah. And here he come and hug me. Yeah. And he, I understood he come home after that and he committed suicide. So it happened then too. Yeah. Well, he was. That was later on, a couple right. of years later. But uh, did you, when you got into those uh, those moments where you have to crawl back to safety? Yeah. What well, do you think of? What do you think about when those moments? Well, my own, mostly about my new wife. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when I got out of there. I had a son that was born over there while I was over there. Really? Well, it took a month till I found out about it because they got word up to me. Huh. And uh, and then he was six months old when I saw him first time. Wow. So you found out that, that you had a son. Yeah. You're well, I knew that was right. coming. You knew it was coming. When did you find out? Can you remember when, when well, you actually I, got the word? Well, the, you know, the mail service was not very good. We were right. on the front line. Sure. And... Uh, but my whole military life was concerned about my new wife at at yeah. home. Yeah. She had she had gone back and went back to living with her parents. Right. And uh, so. Yeah. Unfortunately, really. Do you remember when you got the news that you had a son? I mean, she knew she was pregnant, I imagine. Yeah. But you didn't know when. Do you remember well, the, the, been, the news coming? She was you? writing a letter every day, but yeah. sometimes it, I'd get a week's worth at once. Sure. Were you writing back to her? Yeah, once in a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what were you telling her? Well, how much I loved her. <laughs> uh, yeah. Did you tell, what, what was your impression? You said the peaks were really, what, what does Korea look like? When you landed in Korea, what do you remember well, it looking like? You know, we had, th uh, uh, their seasons are a lot like ours, but more worse. Oh, Every one is more drastic. Really? Winter is super cold, super cold. Yeah. Like 30 below and high, really high humidity. Okay. And the, the uh, thing that was different is that they're, uh, rainy season is July and August. Okay. And uh, I'm telling you, it rained. 
Yeah, well, tell me about the rain we, there. We, uh, uh, there we, we had been in a division rear. We were living in squad tents for a couple of weeks. And uh, when it rains that long, you touch them tents inside and they drip, they leak. Right. There, everything was wet. And you'd get out, you'd have to stand outside in a chow line. You'd have to dump your can, your, your, dish would fill up with water huh. and it, it rained like the hardest downpour we ever get in a thunderstorm for seven days and nights straight like that. And just you just poured. got everything's wet, right? Oh, it just, we were fortunate we were down up in the mountains. Yeah. Because it had run off, you know. Right. But everything lower lawn was flooded. Hmm. Did you, uh, uh, how did you, what, I imagine do you get cold when it rains that much? Oh, I, mean, I imagine you do. The, it's bone chilling. It was cold. Yeah. Well, the first winter, all these, I don't know if you read about, but all the guys froze their feet and hands. Mm -hmm. Yep. They didn't have the clothing yeah, to what, deal with it. Yep. What about the second winter? Second winter, we had pretty good clothes. We had okay. these Mickey Mouse boots, mm -hmm. and, and some guys had tried to fe freeze their feet and hands on purpose to get a, go home. Yeah. And the, so it turned, it was a court martial offense to get froze. So you, you bundled up. Yeah, you had the clothing. Yeah. But you, I didn't. That's another story. Yeah, tell me. They, the military did not have clothes to fit me. I'm pretty long. Yeah. Got big feet. Okay. To this day, I've got uh, deformed toes. Okay. My toes are cooled. The biggest shoe they had was a size 12. Okay, and what shot size do you wear? 15. Can you imagine going on a ten mile hike with all your gear with shoes wow. that are three times three sizes too small? How did you even do that? I mean, what, your it was bloody? tough and it's still I'm still suffering. I've had surgeries on them. Right. I walk on the toenails, especially my left foot. Wow. Because it's bigger than the right foot. Right. And uh, but now I can get shoes. <laughs> so how did you mat did did your feet even fit? If you're 15, how did they fit oh, 12? Well, the toes are all curled up and squished oh, in there. And then you have to walk 10 miles with, with, yeah. with weight. In in the in the Southern California where it's 110 degrees out on a parade field. Yeah, that's, and, not, that's not real fun. I mean. You know, I was in the Army. At that time, if you were drafted, you were drafted for 24 months. Okay. And if you went to Korea and come back, in 19 months, they'd release you. You could go home. Okay. Well, I come back. I went through this so fast that I, I come back and I didn't have 19 months in yet. So I went home on a 30-day leave and then I had to go back to Fort Lewis, Washington for 45 days, just loafing around until I get the 19 months in. Wow. And then after 19 months, they just... Uh, transfer you to the reserves. Okay. And uh, you, you spend about six years there until they finally sent me a honorable discharge. What did you, when you went to um, uh, Korea, you missed your wife, obviously you missed your son, uh, but what did you, what else did you remember missing about home? Well, you know, they, like I said, we, they flew us over, so we got right. over there quick. But coming back, we come back on a ship, mm -hmm. troop ship, an old time ship, troop ship. Mm -hmm. And you always heard about the good food in the Navy. Right. And here, the Army, out in them hills, they packed the stoves, kitchen stoves, and all the food on their back. Right. We, had, we had some old Korean Chogi boys, we called them. They helped pack that stuff up in the mountain. Mm -hmm. Every day they'd go to a little higher on the mountain. And uh, but we always ate better than we did on that damn ship. I'll really? You, that, what did ship you eat was, the that ship was out of food. Absolutely out of food. Huh. They, and they, it, it was broke down on the way over there, too. And they didn't take no food on over there because it wasn't fit. And uh, at one time it was broke down in the South Pacific going home with 5,000 guys on it. 
in uh, in a calm. You've heard of a calm. Yep. You, I happened to got on a sweeping detail, and I went to the, got up on the deck. The, oh, did that fresh air feel good? Yeah. And uh, it was sitting dead with no fans running, no motors running for three days till they got it running again. And so it was pretty, there was like 5,000 guys on there and you were restricted to your hammock. Like huh. these old time troop ships, you see this yep. pictures where there's, the one of them is, there's seven high, the, the hammocks. They're just a canvas bunk. Mm -hmm. And the one's on the floor and the other one's on the ceiling. You climb up through to get up to the top. Yeah. And uh, you were restricted to that bunk, hmm. except if you were on a sweeping detail. And uh, that was the most terrible thing that I ever went through. That was worse than all the front line in Korea. Why? Just because of the boredom well, and, the, and the hungry? And... Well, that's when my I hurt my back, too. So okay. I do have a service-connected disability for that. Hmm. But uh, just the cramped quarters. Yeah, that and, sounds miserable. And you you could not pass somebody in them piles. That's how one would have to crawl in a bunk. Mm -hmm. That's how tight they were. Yeah. And uh, did did you ever think um, uh, when you were when you were over there, I might not make it home to Laurel? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So th those aren't those that has to. Because you don't know exactly when you're going to rotate out. Because even if you have the points, if there was no one behind you to fill in, right, mm -hmm. you could get you could be over there for a bit. Mm -hmm. So you weren't really sure. When did how uh, when you were over there? What was daily life like on the front lines? Tell me about that. What, well, what, what we were like? we were living in a sandbag hut. We called them hoochies. Mm -hmm. There were a, a hole in the ground with we had some logs on top, and then. A, sandbags on two or three layers of sandbags on top mm -hmm. and we were laying in there in the dirt dirt mm -hmm. floors dirt walls and the rats were in there what were the rats like oh they were like a house cat yeah i've never seen anything like that in my life <laughs> really and uh, they you know if we had some crackers or something they were rustling around in them at night mm. and uh, you couldn't kill the rat because the rat had carried a mite which has caused hemorrhagic fever. Hmm. Probably heard of that. Yeah. And uh, if you kill that rat, that that mite would find another warm body, which is you. Right. And you'd get hemorrhagic fever and you, you bleed to death internally. Right. So you lived with the rats. Wow. They're, I heard they're huge. It's, oh, they were like cats. Yeah. Did you, what, what was the, uh, what, you said you ate well, the army fed you well, or at least fed you okay, I'm guessing. Well, if, well I was pretty much pleased with the army food. Okay. Even on the front lines in Korea. Hmm. What was the, when you were, you were doing heavy artillery, so you were firing, I'm guessing. It wasn't that, heavy auxiliary, or, just. Uh, just artillery? Uh, it was, it was the uh, second step up okay which was uh, machine guns and mortars so, so were you you were firing at i'm guessing chinese troops. yeah who, absolutely and you could see them i mean this was yeah. something you could see them sometimes they could see you, you, could, yeah. you could see their trench okay. along in front of the hill what were the what, what was your opinion of them as soldiers how were the were the chinese good soldiers bad soldiers good well ones? the chinese in some in one respect they had it over on us in what Maybe you're not. I wasn't supposed to say nothing like that. You're sworn to secrecy. Okay. And at this point in life, they can come and get me. If they I want. don't think they're going to come and get you. They have to get me too, Bill. So let them get us both. Why, why were they? What, what did they have with us? That well, we... they was always stealing our ammunition if they could get it. Okay. And they could get some once in a while. Okay. And uh, our rifles were thirty caliber. Theirs were 31. So they could take the bullets. They could use our bullets. They were a little sloppy, but they worked. And our mortars, the big stovepipe mortars, mm -hmm. ours were 80 millimeter and theirs were 81. Same deal. We couldn't put their 
ammunition in our mortars, it wouldn't fit, but they could use ours. They're a little sloppy and maybe they'd get off somewhere. Okay. But they did. In that respect, they had one over on us. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard that. Uh, were they, uh, uh, did you have to go out on patrol, night patrols and yeah. all that? What was it? Not as much with beans and heavy weapons. Okay. But, um, but well, the foot soldiers, every night they'd go. Did you have to go on patrol yourself? Not really, no. Okay. Was that, uh, and you lived kind of in tent or hoochies, and, and is that tough living? I mean, what do you do during the day? Well, you work on equipment. Okay. And get, keep the weapons clean. And that's, uh, th th that's an M1? Yeah. Okay. What's your opinion of an M1? Was that a good well, rifle? Well, well, it was had to be good. It was used for a, a lot of years. Yeah. We had 30 caliber carbines, too. Okay. Which uh, fired about 30 rounds in the clip. Okay. And uh, and so this is pretty pretty mountainous terrain. Did you, were you, did you make friends or could you be friendly with the guys in your unit? Did you get close? Oh, yeah. Or was there, was oh, yeah. There, okay. We, I was, uh, there were quite a few Mormon guys in our outfit from uh, Idaho and Utah. Okay. And uh, talking about smoking, mm -hmm. I, everybody smoked. Right. You know, the stress of the situation and whatnot, because okay. you got, everybody was issued a, car, uh, a carton of cigarettes a week. Okay. And they're laying there in apple boxes full, any kind of cartons, anytime you want, any kind you want. Okay. And everybody started smoking, the stress and everything. Mm -hmm. And the Mormon guys, that was a no-no. And so when they got close to going home, they started weaning themselves. <laughs> that was kind of funny. They, they would, they would swore to one another that if they smoked, they would hit them. Right. And they were winning themselves, getting ready to go home. <laughs> I come, I smoked a little while while I was at home too, mostly okay. once a day after a meal or something like that. But I quit too then. Yeah. What did you? Uh, what food or did you miss stuff at home? What 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 kind of uh, comforts of living did you really miss when you were over there? Oh, oh everything. I yeah. missed missed my new wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you? Um, uh, when you wrote over, when you wrote back to your family or your wife, what did you tell them was going on in Korea? Did well, you, you tell couldn't them tell them too much. Okay. You were sworn to secrecy on everything. Okay. And uh, there was, uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, you were sworn to secrecy, and you, uh, so you couldn't tell them much. Was it? Was, were the days interesting? Did they seem, or were they boring? Or what, what were the days like over there? Well, it was more quiet during the days. Most of the action was at night. These patrols, mm -hmm. each each side would send out a patrol, a dozen guys or so. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they'd all come back, and sometimes they wouldn't. Right. Well, being in the heavy weapons company, I never had to go on them patrols. Okay. Yeah. Did you, um, uh, was it, do you think that being a farm kid from Montana was made it harder or easy for you over there? I don't know. It was probably tougher. Okay. The, the uh, in the in your midterm of your tour in Korea, you got a five days R and R in uh, Japan, oh. and uh, mine was on New Year's. Oh, Christmas Day, I headed down south to get out of there and I went to r, r to Osaka, Japan. And on Christmas Day, it was colder than blazes. Hmm. And uh, I was in a, on a Korean train heading south and it was standing room only in cattle cars. Absolutely wow. packed with people. They were hanging on the outsides and everything. And my Christmas dinner was a can of frozen beans out of the sea ration. Oh, that, Christmas. That, you'll never forget that Christmas, oh. I bet. Well, that doesn't oh. sound like, it doesn't sound very good, a can of beans out of the sea rations. Yeah. What did you, um, so you, you spend time over there, you, you're you running sometimes troops, you're using the, the heavy weapons. Uh, then when did you finally get to come home? 
Well, I, when I left my outfit, I was in the 45th Division, mm -hmm. which is Oklahoma National Guard. Mm -hmm. And the Oklahoma National Guard got pretty well beat up in the first winter. Mm -hmm. So most of the National Guards were already home, but they left their colors over there, which was their division headquarters and everything. And then they started filling that back up with uh, draftees. And there were some R, uh, regular army guys too that signed up, but most of them were two year draftees. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, you know, I lost my thought again. That's okay. <laughs> so they were just over there for two years. I was over there for uh, 10 months. Okay. Nine months was the quickest you could absolutely get out of there. And being in a four point zone for nine months, that's 36 points. That's how much you had there. So you we, were mostly in, and those four points were for combat. Absolutely. Zone, right? When I left over there, our unit had the record of being on the front line, the longest of anybody. I, I rotated in 10 months. Like I said, you not only had to have 36 months, you had to have a replacement. Mm -hmm. Well, it took me another month till I got a replacement. I rotated in 10 months with 40 points. Hmm. That's about that's as quick a, as anybody. Good. Did you, knowing that the winter before, the Chinese had overrun. Oh, everything. And overrun every, everything. Were you worried as a soldier that you'd be overrun again? Oh, yeah. I always were. Okay. That uh, when I went down to uh, Inchon, I think, where we went on R&R, &R, I went through the city of Seoul, and at one time that was the biggest city in the world. Mm -hmm. One of the bigger cities. Yeah. And there wasn't a, a whole building left in the city. It was all bombed out wreckage. Yeah. Because they had been through there a couple of times. Yep. And uh, there. Yeah, were... that, that must have been something for a kid from Laurel, Montana yeah. to see a completely leveled, huge city. It must have been almost unreal. What did you well, think when you were walking through there or going I through I didn't there? realize that until uh, later. The Olympics, I think, were yep. there. And seeing that city, how they, we build it up again. Yeah. And uh, there wasn't a paved street in the city of Seoul. Mm. It was everything reverted back to gravel. Mm. And uh, they didn't have any equipment. You'd see a Koreans uh, mixing cement. Mm -hmm. Be about four guys on one side of a square box, it's about six feet square. And they'd flip this gravel with a shovel. This side would flip it that way, and the other side would flip it that way, and they'd mix it up. Pour a little water in there. They never had cement mixers. Wow. And the, and the, the town or the cities had uh, honey wagons. Mm -hmm. They'd pick up even our waste hmm. and dump it on their fields. Hmm. And it stink. You smell that country from the time you pulled in till you left. So it stunk. It was terrible. They'd, uh, they would plant them rice. There was little fields uh, that rice all over the, even in the hills, just a little 10 foot field. And they would uh, start these rice plants in a little corner. When they'd get up about that high, they'd transplant them in rows. And, and all you'd see was hind ends and elbows out there. <laughs> they were bent over transplanting these wow. rice field plants. Did you have much, while well, you are over there, do you have any interaction or much interaction with the Korean people? Well, we did. We had, actually, we had some soldiers in with us, mm -hmm. what they called Katusa. Okay. They were uh, Korean soldiers attached to the USA, is what it was. And uh, they were to learn our, our ways of mm -hmm. running the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had some of them with us. Yeah. And we cussed them all the time. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Did they, you? Why? Well, they had their own way of doing things. Right. For one thing, they'd climb up on the toilet seat and crap instead of uh, on a uh, haunches Sit. instead of sitting on it. <laughs> crap all over the toilet seat. <laughs> That's no good, right? So what about? 
What about when you got, uh, so you were over there 10 months, when did you find out you were coming home? Well, some, of course, that's number one in your mind all the time is sure. get the heck out of here. Right. And uh, when finally I got a replacement is when I got to go home. And I, I'll tell you that last month was pretty tough. Why? Tell me about that. Well, you, you know you're eligible to go home, mm -hmm. but you don't have a replacement. And that new wife sitting at home. That was a big thing. And, and you got a son by, by then. By then I had a son, yes. Yeah. And he, my son was six months old before I saw him. Hmm. Well, so uh, you, you're just waiting. Do you, when you're going through that and you know you're eligible, you got the points, do you ask a, an officer or someone, hey, listen, or a sergeant, hey, when am I leaving, or how does that work? Oh, yeah. Those are your and orders. they just say whenever. Finally, when a replacement comes, you're got out of there. Do you remember when your replacement came? You'd, you'd, you'd uh, leave one at a time like that. It wasn't replacing the whole works. Sure. Was it hard uh, Was it hard seeing other people go and then you had yeah, to stay? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so once you... Once the whole you, thing was that new wife at home that, well, I, that yeah, I only was with for a month. <laughs> right, and then they take you. What about, so when you're going home, what do you remember about going home? What do you remember? You you were then then you're going home and oh, you're that, stuck in the middle of the sea. That that the trip home was the worst time of my life, even though it was worse than the front lines of Korea. Wow. What do you remember about? How did you finally get home? How did they did they repair the ship or tell me about that? They repaired that? the ship, I guess. Okay. You didn't have much interaction because you were restricted to that bunk most of the time, except like I said, if you got on a cleanup detail. How did you pass the time? I mean, there's no TV, there's no Lay, radio. Laying in the bunk and looking at the guy who's laying right above you, this close. It was torture, torture, yeah. torture. Yeah, it sounds almost like prison just It then. was absolutely. So how long did it take you to make it from from uh, from Korea back to the States? I think in 30 days. 30 days. Yeah. Long 30 days. Yeah. And where did you, where did you, where did the the ship make landing where did you guys uh disembark frisco frisco what was no, that like no we went to uh, fort lewis washington okay, you went back up to washington yeah. what was that like when what what time did you what what month did you get home well it was really anticipating getting out of the getting home okay so you get home and then tell me about coming back to montana what was how did you do that well, there was, we one time, well, the time when she came home with me from California, we came to Roundup on the Milwaukee Road. Okay. Because we could get home 24 hours quicker than on the Northern Pacific from Seattle. Hmm. And uh, so we came and her parents, they came up to Roundup to pick me up hmm. an extra day. <laughs> and... Uh, but that was before I went over. Yeah. And, uh, and what was that like seeing your wife and son? That was what that was the goal all the time. I bet that was a happy moment. Oh, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Best moment of your life? Oh, yes. <laughs> what what was it like you hadn't seen your wife and now you've got this 6-month-old kid. That's that's a kid who's who can at least I'm guessing crawl or He's got, he's already a personality. That's no, not a small not, baby, right? No, he was just six months. He yeah. wasn't walking or crawling yet. Okay. Did, did you, uh, do you remember that moment being introduced to your son? Was that a surreal moment for you? I didn't hear that. Oh, was it surreal? Was it odd oh, for you to was, ask, okay, here's your son? That's That must yeah. be kind of a shock, a good, but a shocking moment. Yeah? Yeah. What was it, uh, so then what did you do once you got home? Was, did you rest, relax? Because you had to go back, right? Did you have to go yeah, back? Yeah, I had to go back to Fort Lewis for 45 days. That must have been torture. We went, uh, yeah, just more or less nothing for you to do. Well, actually, they sent me on a prisoner chase. What? To, to go pick up another prisoner. How did that which, work? Tell me about that. Well, you uh, see, when we come home from Korea, we got a 30-day leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was sent to me and another guy were sent to uh, northern Montana to uh, Arlie, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, 
this guy, this was on a weekend. This other guy lived in somewhere up in there. So he went home over the weekend and I'm just loafing around in the hotel room in, in R. Lee. And uh, Monday morning, the, we went to the sheriff's office to pick up our prisoner and uh, brought him out. We had to load up our weapons mm -hmm. uh, just for their sake, because if you lost a prisoner, if he got away on you, you pulled his sentence. Mm. So the sheriff brought that prisoner out, and here was one of our Korean buddies. <laughs> yeah, really. He it was an he was an Indian from Northern Browning, yeah. and uh, he was a pretty decent guy, and uh, he went uh, home on thirty day leave, and he went back to his old Indian days, and never went back at the end of thirty days. Mm, he went AWOL, and uh, here Richard Rutherford, I'll never forget him. <laughs> and I said, hell, we we never had to use a weapon, to, but you had to. Right. That was the protocol. Like, and we had, we took him back in the train, and we could not uh, shackle him to the seat. We had to put him on, handcuff him onto his arm and your arm, and uh, all the time you had your weapon on. Hmm. Well, we were. He was a friend of ours. We didn't need no damn weapon, but there was. That was the way it was. <laughs> huh. So you do that, and then when you're finally released, you're released back into the guard, but that meant that you could come back home and start farming, and then you got, did the life resume back to normal once you got home? <coughs> well, I went, they signed me to a reserve outfit in Billings, okay. and I'd go to their meetings and sit there, and nobody knew what the hell I was there for. I went a few times, and I quit going, okay. and uh, I, finally they... I think they sent me my discharge a little early, even. Hmm. And uh, that was the biggest joke there ever was with them guard meetings. <laughs> what was it? What do you think? Uh, what, was serving your time in the Army a good thing for you, Bill? Well, I, I at that time, when I got out, I said everybody should have to do two years. Okay. It was a lot of growing up. Yeah. Do you think do you think that way now? Do you think everybody should still have to do two years? Well, I don't know. I never think much about it. <laughs> Why do you think people? You know, they call Korea the forgotten war. Do you think it's been forgotten? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> not by guys like us. Yeah. What do you hope people? What I hope to do is to preserve stories like yours, so that people can, when people want to know what it was like, they will, they can have someone to listen to. What do you hope people remember about the Korean War? Well, I'm not here to be a hero. I no. never was. Right. I was there to do my job and get the heck home to my new wife. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you, uh, uh, looking back at it now and then seeing that Korea is still in the news, does it surprise you that Korea, North Korea, is still in the news? Oh, that... Kim Jong Un or her ought to be blowed up pieces. Right. Yeah. Do you think? Uh, uh, did Did you when when you saw us? Uh, when you saw the other war uh, wars when, uh, like Vietnam, uh, and you saw people being drafted, what was your feeling then? I was never too fond of the Vietnam War. I. Mm -hmm. Or the soldiers. It seemed like they were crybabies to us. Yeah. To me. Yeah. And well, that's all you see in the papers. Vietnam veteran. You've never seen nothing about the Korean War. Well, I was like, I called you and said, I was pleased that you were finally bringing finally out the story. Said, yeah. Not to be a hero, but just to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a fairly, br I mean, it wasn't short for if you're over there, it didn't seem so short, but it was a. Do you think people came home after World War II and just kind of got back to life and forgot about Korea because World War II was over? Do you feel, yeah. is, it that, is, is that, that part of that the reason That was pretty forgotten? close after World War II. Yeah. Four, did, you, five. did you think as you were getting older that you had, I don't want to say dodge the bullet because you knew you were 1A, but did you kind of, did you ever think when you were in high school that, that you might be drafted or did you mm. just kind of blow it off? I didn't get I didn't get married to get out of the draft either. Yeah. You know, if you if you got married and your wife was pregnant, you got deferred. Right. 
Well, that's what they were afraid of. That's why they got me real quick. Right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Did you? Did you? So you knew that other guy from Laurel. Did you know a lot of other guys from Laurel no. who were over there, or are you kind of one of a very few? It was mostly the, like I said, guys from Utah and Idaho. Mm -hmm. But this guy wasn't in in our unit at all. He was an infantry soldier. Okay. And uh, he just, I just, I knew him in school, but he was younger than me and different grade, or he was my age, but he had failed a couple of years. Hmm. And uh, he had a little brother. It was a big, tall kid and a little brother. And they were poor people. Sure. And I knew who he was, but I really never talked to him. Yeah. But here the guy comes and hugs me. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was well, dramatic. A, a whole world away. Imagine that. What was, uh, what did the, besides your wife and your kids, what did you really enjoy or look forward to when you got home? What seemed very good that you, well, we, you missed? We, uh, like I said, when we got married, we had furniture and appliances yeah. in a little farmhouse in Laurel, southeast of town, and next, just east of the refinery. Hmm. And we mothballed everything, and, we, and she went back to her parents, and we came back and opened everything up, and the house was still empty. Hmm. And my brothers were still both single. So. <laughs> But that was the part that was, uh, when I look back on it, that was really unjust. Yeah. yeah. Pick me out just because I got married. Yeah. Well, the th I'm sure the thought behind that was, if this would have kept up, they might have got another one. Right. But in the meantime, my wife get pregnant, and we would, I'd get away from them. Right. Right. Well, I just want to say, Bill, thank you so much for serving. Thank you for doing what you were called to do. I know you're not a hero, but to people like me, just serving is heroic. So thank you, and thank you for your service, and thank you for coming in and sharing your story. I says um, the heroes are the ones that are, got shot. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. Thank you for, for going over there, and uh, thank you for sharing your story so that we don't forget it. I really appreciate it today. So. Well, I didn't want to... I want to be a hero, given that story, either. <laughs> You're not a hero. You're just a, a, a thank you. So this has been Daryl Ehrlich with Stories of Honor. Thanks so much.